Hello, my name is Owen, and welcome to a quick review of Dune by Frank Herbert. Uh, what I want to do today is not just answer the question, is Dune good? But if it's good, is it truly great? Because uh, obviously this is a well-beloved book that has spawned uh, many uh, pieces of work after it. A lot of inspiration from a lot of modern sci-fi or even not so modern sci-fi and, and same thing with fantasy as well have gotten their inspiration from the work of Frank Herbert particularly this first book uh, but diving into it I have read this book before in the past and this is our book of the month for March uh, the second month of our, our our little communal book club where you guys recommend books and I put your reputation on the line when I read them recommended by Bibliomanic Panic a bit of a softball if you ask me because obviously this book is good but that's what I'm saying that's where we're raising the stakes it has to be great for me to respect you if you're going to throw me a softball like this. So I went into this with a critical eye uh, because, I, I, like I said, I read it before in the past, and I do remember enjoying it, but I don't remember being blown away by it. So I, I came into this, I don't know, maybe it's not for me, or maybe I was just too stupid to understand. It turns out, spoiler alert, it was the second one. Uh, I really did not read this as deeply as... I needed to, I think, the first time, and I think I found this book a lot more rich and a lot more rewarding uh, rereading it the second time. And, and in regards to the new movies, too, because obviously I read this in March in celebration of Timothy Chalamet and Dune Part 2, uh, I think if you haven't read the books but you've seen the movies, the movies do a great job at capturing the spirit of, of the book. Uh, and, and I'll go into that, I guess, a little bit more and, and when talking about things that I like about the book. And, and the first things first, the thing that you're punched with when starting reading this book is just the complexity and, and deepness of this world. Uh, Herbert's one of those insane authors where he clearly spent a lot of time thinking about things that no other person writing a book would ever have the endurance to think of like really really dull mundane stuff like if you even think about the appendix appendix appendixes appendixes is that how you say plural appendix the appendixes uh, at the end of the book it's like the ecology it's terminology for the imperium different houses many of them we do not encounter throughout the entirety of this book or if they're if they're mentioned they're mentioned only very briefly and they really don't have that much relevance on the plot obviously like the ecology of dune does have an importance to it, but to the average reader, it's not something that you really want to sink your teeth into. So the fact that he wrote an entire Pangs about it just gives you a thought about how much he thought about these kind of mundane things. He's one of those authors. So it can be intimidating diving into a doorstop type book and, and being thrown into this world with thousands and thousands of years of history and the author's not afraid to, to show those thousands of years of history and how they play with the factions and the factions plans and the different factions and even if they're not to the forefront how their influences throughout time influence the present day plot and just so many different layers here and, and like i said that could be very overwhelming even to someone like me who reads a lot of more complex work it's always the hardest part of starting a new sci-fi series new fantasy series especially complex ones it's the first couple hundred pages that are really make or break i feel like for these kinds of books and Sometimes you got to push yourself through them, right? Because you're getting so much new information that it's tiring to read them. So if you're like, if you're a fan of the movies, you're diving in this book. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people aren't able to push through all this, all this chaos of terms. But that being said, I think Herbert does a great job at kind of alleviating this problem a little bit by having such fantastic characters. And uh, I, I think the movies kind of understood this as well. But this book is really separated into two sections. Obviously the movies are in two parts, but that's why I said I think they understand it. But the beginning of it, the plot is more straightforward. I feel like we're, we're stuck or we're placed in this world through the internal feelings and thoughts of our main characters, right? We're, we're bouncing around the head of Jessica, of Paul, of the Duke, uh, and we really get an intimate feeling of these characters. We know instantly what they're thinking and within paragraphs, which is what the other person is thinking when they hear stuff like this. So uh, Herbert is very upfront with where these characters are at mentally at the start of this book. And that gives us something to latch onto that's more tangible, right? Because we're throwing out words like the spice and the planets and the emperor and Arrakis. And it can be very overwhelming, but if we could latch ourselves onto Paul is feeling scared for his father. His father... Um, has a feeling of dread. He knows he's walking into a trap. We, this gets established very early. Even the villains, even the Harkonnens at the very beginning, they lay out their plan very step by step. It's like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. 
And I, I think the first time I read it, I almost overthought that. I'm like, why would they be, why would the author be giving me the exact plan of how these next couple hundred pages are going to go out, going down to the, the protagonist knowing what's going to happen to them, and then just plays out that way? Because it, he's trying to make the streamlined plot of the beginning of the book as easy as possible. So you can really immerse yourself, be invested in these characters, uh, and slowly start to understand the world and the world of the Ben Gesserits and, and the Fremen and, and all these people coming together. So I think that's a great way to introduce it. And I, and I found myself loving that writing style to, to be so open with your character's thoughts and feelings and not just your main protagonist, not just sticking close to Paul, but, but bouncing around almost every single character that enters the forefront of the story at any particular moment. And then obviously, uh, as the book transitions, it becomes more of a commentary, it becomes a little bit more philosophical, right? And, and the book does take a turn. And I remember reading it the first time, I I found it a little bit harder to read after, I, not even the halfway point, it's more like the two thirds point, right? When When Paul starts to truly become this religious figure where he kind of detaches himself from the humanness of Paul Atreides and becomes more of like this prophet and drinks the water of life. And even his mother does the same thing. They kind of become detached from their personalities a little bit in the second half of the book. And, and things go very, very fast. And not to talk about the movies again, but that's one thing I think the movies did fantastically, uh, specifically in part two, is they, they kept a groundedness to Paul. They kept him as a character with thoughts and feelings and conflicts, where while that's present in the book, it's, it's less about that. He is more of almost a vehicle for this movement. And there's moments where he's like, wait a minute, things are going a little bit too far. Things are getting a little bit too radical. However, I must go this way. So he just goes that way continuously. Uh, whereas in the, in the movie, they kind of give him some more conflict. He kind of fights against his prophecy and... Uh, they just make him more complex, which I think works better for the visual, visual medium. Uh, because truly, this book, at the end of the day, is about the dangers... Of, of a messiah-like figure. And even though the book ends on, some would say an unsatisfying note, it, it kind of leaves you, it, it leaves you incomplete, right? And it's amazing to me that people finish Dune thinking that Paul is just a pure good guy. He's a superhero. He saved the day, he defeated the Harkonnens. Not the case, not the case. Uh, but I really think it's a fantastic and unique way to tell a story. And I will say the book does do that better than in the movie. Uh, this kind of descent of Paul's character and the, the leading to the Holy War. It's, I don't know, it, it takes off, it becomes less about characters and less about the plot and becomes more about a religious movement and how that builds upon itself. And it's just like the inevitability of everything. And I feel like that's one of the major themes because uh, obviously it's a lot about prophecy. It's a lot about seeing the future. But even though Paul has moments of, I don't want this to happen, he can't help but do it anyway. Uh, and, and there's a lot of weird stuff going on, like the magic and his sister and all that stuff, which I feel like even now on a reread kind of goes over my head. Um, but I will say... Finishing Dune for a second time, it does make me want to continue the story uh, and at least read Dune Messiah and, and see how this plays out. Uh, but I really think it is a fantastic book. And, and like I said, it's carried by these characters. They, they grab us with these characters because we care about Paul. We even care about Jessica. Uh, but then as they kind of lose themselves in the story, um, there's one of two reactions you could have. You could you could follow the kind of character arc of Stilgar, right? Uh, you like them and then suddenly you become fanatical about them, which I feel like is a lot of people that miss the point. They almost get swept up in the fever uh, of Paul and, and the Muad'Dib and the Lisan Al-Dib and the, whatever the, the word that starts with a K that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, but really the building of that. Or you can kind of become like a gurney, right? Because even he starts to doubt. It's like, well, at the beginning of the book, we see the quality uh, and the honor uh, of Duke Leto's character, right? Uh, but then as we progress, Gurney makes comments, well, it's like your dad wouldn't have done that. Your dad valued lives over equipment and you see Paul kind of losing himself um, and, and having Gurney as a character that could compare the beginning, like ideological or uh, example, right? I guess like the, the, the pinnacle of honor uh, in, in Paul's father and comparing that to who Paul is now as a leader. 
there is a difference and it is slightly worse. And even though these are quick scenes and, and Gurney at the end of the day does still fight for Paul, does still love Paul, we could tell that something is off. And I think that it's such an interesting way to not deconstruct your protagonist, but present your protagonist in a way that's like, are you supposed to like him at all by the end of the book? Uh, you're supposed to root for him and how much of this stuff is out of his control, right? Because so, so much of this lore, like I said, the world building is thousands of years in the past. And a lot of the actions of all the characters in this book are, are predetermined by plans set in motion thousands of years ago, uh, which shows the complexity of the world and, and the plan that Herbert has and also the focusness, focusness of this work. I think that it's very hard for people to argue against... Um, like the, the, the plot of Paul's, Paul's Ascent. Because I know a lot of people, especially with the conversation started up about the movies, they, they said that when they watch Dune Messiah, the movie, they're going to be so surprised about the turn that Paul's character makes. But I think that even having not read that book, it's very, very clear that, that Frank Herbert in this book had a, had a clear purpose with the, with the thing of Paul. And even um, Brian Herbert writes a great ending or, or like a... I don't know, just, a, just his thoughts about his father in, in this particular work. And he even talks about the negative reaction that Dune Messiah met. Because they're like, why would you take down my superhero like that? Uh, but then he even goes to say, there's many, many moments in this book where he tells you exactly where he's going with it. And if you missed it, it's because you weren't paying attention. Uh, which is a, a quality of an author that I do respect. It's it's not hand-holded at all. Uh, but I, that being said, through the characters and through the kind of like telegraphing of the plot like at the end of the day it's a plot about rebellion and betrayal and going back and taking back your land with all these philosophical layers uh, on top of it so just following the characters and following the plot um because it's so straightforward and because he really gives you that in glance or in-depth look uh, it allows you to kind of expand your mind and think about more of the complex things about what exactly is going on here and it kind of makes you deconstruct maybe series or books that don't do this as well because there's so many chosen one type stories where um this is not explored like how fervorous the, these these populations could get around the chosen one and how this idea of arrakis being a green planet filled with water was kind of manipulated um i don't know it's fascinating it's complex and i think it's a it's a fantastic book and some of the deepest pieces of sci-fi that I've ever been written even since then, even with its all influences. But I see influences of Dune in, in stuff like A Song of Ice and Fire with the complexity of the politics and the, the aspects of The Chosen One, how everything's not as straightforward. But it's not as... I don't know. It's not as overtly pessimistic, I feel like, as some like grimdark um, type fantasy. But it does have that kind of flavor, right? Or maybe that smell, rather. This was kind of a rambly, all-over-the-place review, uh, but I could see why people get truly, truly immersed in a world like this. And I don't know if I, not if I didn't like it enough, but if I have the energy or endurance to truly dive into this world and its history and read all the books in the series like I know so many people do, but you can't help but respect this world. And I will be reading at least one more book in the series just because... I think some of the most interesting parts were these factions and being able to explore them in further novels. I think it's fascinating. But that's all I got. That was our month of March review. Bibliomanic Panic, you are a certified reader, my friend. Uh, keep an eye out for the month, book of the month for April if you got any recommendations. I got a nice list going on. I'll be picking it shortly. But for future months, put your recommendations down below. You might just win the spot, the spotlight of me talking about you and your tastes. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe if you like the video and you want to see more like in the future. And as always, thanks for sticking around.